Good evening, once again. It's a pleasure to be back and it's a pleasure to share today. So over this week, I have had a conversation with some of my colleagues and the question has been coming has been around what's the role of a QPPP, qualified person for former covigilance, and how does one become one? And the kind of conversation that we've been having majorly from a pharmacist perspective has been around one understanding of QPPV responsibilities and roles, and the other bit how to be one with a, in anchoring on the focus on the what training, what qualifications do I need to have to be a QPPV? And I think in this account, then for me, what I felt is by getting this information available to people who would want to pursue this kind of a line of practice, it would help them. And on this account, then I'm going to define what a QPPV is. With, it is in a Kenyan context, and then looking at what are the roles, and then where do we get these resources, and how do you become one in your practice? So to start it off, who, who is a QPPV? And this is an individual that has actually been named by the marketing authorization holder. We all know in this space we're talking about medicines. So if you talk about medicines, we know that all our medications have to be registered or medical devices, they all have to be registered by the pharmacy and poisons board in Kenya. When you register your medicine, it's now available in the market for uptake and for use. Then there are probable side effects that might arise from use of these medicines. There's safety information that is generated. And oftentimes this is captured as post-marketing surveillance, post-marketing post use, evidence use, and all that. Any information that arises during that period needs to be reported, including quality defects that might affect the outcome of the care of a patient. It might not be actual real evidence of an adverse event or adverse reaction, but there's a possibility that probably a medicine was used by a particular patient who had developed a particular outcome which was not expected, and therefore we might have suspicion. And in case we have suspected adverse events, then this needs to be reported to the responsible authorities and this is to the pharmacy and poisons board. Then who is responsible for this reporting? This is where we talk about the QPPV. So as a marketing authorization holder, assuming company A registered product B in the market, then company A has to appoint an individual to serve as the qualified person for pharmacovigilance, QPPV. And this QPPV who will be appointed will then be responsible on issues on safety and quality of medicines that are registered by this company A in Kenya for as long as this person still has a standing marketing authorization holder and that person is the appointed qualified person for pharmacovigilance in the country. Therefore, their responsibility is around ensuring the safety and efficacy of the medicines and any quality incidents that are there are reported to the regulatory authority. And when you talk about the reporting mechanisms, we have the risk management plan. There's a risk to use of medicines. So what measures are we putting in place as an organization, as a company, to ensure that we are able to mitigate these risks, to overcome them? In case a person uses our medicine, and this person who uses medicine or medicine then has a negative outcome, an adverse reaction. How do we deal with such? Do we have risk management plans? And how long have we been using our medications? It's all that kind of information. So a risk management plan has to be in place. And normally for safety related information, every company is required to have a further pharmacovigilance system master file. And therefore, this is a master, a master file that is documenting how your safety reporting aspects are all documented, related, and addressed. And we talk about it from the WHO definition of pharmacovigilance. It's the mechanism of detecting or identifying, investigating, assessing, and analyzing. And beyond the assessing and analyzing is about understanding the probable causes, then ultimately reporting and preventing the occurrence of such kind of incidences over time so that you ensure our medicines are safe to the patients who ultimately are using them or to the end consumers, and that is our mission as service providers in the healthcare space. So if that is the case, then you need to ask yourself, with a pharmacovigilance system master file that needs to be closed within the organization, the role of a QPPV is to have access to this file and to be able to use it in disseminating information to those who need it to, so that to ensure at any one point, the regulatory authority can access information on how we are managing our safety reporting and safety documentation from a company perspective to uphold public health interest, which is critical. The risk management plan, I mentioned about it. Then we know we have periodic safety update reports or periodic benefit risk assessment reports. And oftentimes for medicines, we could weigh the cost benefit analysis, the risk benefit analysis and all that. And they also look at the safety update reports. Overuse, how many incidences have we reported? Have we investigated them? One, when we're doing the investigations, 
is there aspect on correlation, causality, or there is lack of this? And if there is lack of this, then we still need to document them. When we document, we now submit them to the regulatory authorities based on the timeline that are stipulated and specified. It is the role of the QPPV to be able to follow up on these particular measures and see that that information is available and is provided to the regulator to make an informed decision on whether the medicine is still allowed to be introduced into the country or should not be introduced anymore. And if not, the, what are the rationale behind that? So this is the kind of information we need to be providing. And other information would be in terms of, let's say, for example, line listing of particular products, adding up statements when you don't have a PSUR and all that. All these information need to be provided. Then we talk about adverse events. The criticality of adverse events, as we note them, they are varied. There are some that are fatal and life-threatening, and those needs to be reported within seven days as per the Kenyan guidelines. So in that case, then after within seven days, you should be able to report it. So you need to have a robust risk identification, detection, and reporting mechanism to be sure that you have the data available within the seven days. And oftentimes, there's normally provision that at times you might provide preliminary findings within the seven days and ask for an addition to provide additional information within the subsequent eight days, so that in 15 days, all a comprehensive report on this fatal life threatening condition as adverse event has been reported. For non-fatal non or non-life-threatening but serious adverse events, these also need to be reported to the health authority. And normally, this reporting has to be done within 15 days. Then other than that, we have other reports that might not be serious, might not be critical, non-serious, not non-threatening local reports need to be reported within 30 calendar days. All foreign fatal or serious or non-serious reactions, if they did not happen within the country, within Kenya, then you are required to report these as per the regular timelines within the periodic safety update report. And why is this the case? This is the case because if they do not happen in the country and the product has, is being used in the country, probably we have limited risk or it might not be detected. And therefore, the timelines is when you're supposed to be submitting the periodic safety update report or the periodic benefit risk evaluation report. On other occasions, the reason as to why we have the stringent timelines for the local adverse events is because it's one, it's a clear indication that the medicine is available in circulation in our market. If one of our past people as a citizen has been suffer, suffered a con, an adverse event, whether fatal, serious, or non-serious, there's a higher chance that another person with the probable genetic predisposition or pre genetic risk because of our environmental pharmacogenetic factors, then they might be at a risk. And we need to take action to ensure they don't suffer more in that kind of a market. So those are some of the things that we need to be critical about. Then for periodic safety update reports, we know that these can be submitted to the regulatory authority upon request. On another case, it can be every six months from the authorization until the product is in the market, every six months upon launch of the product into the market. Then after every two years, continuously for the next two years, then from there now, there after every three years. So six months from authorization until the product is placed in the market, six months for the first two years on the market, annually for the next two years, then thereafter every three years onwards until the end of time, until there's no need to submit it anymore or when the authority requests for such kind of documentation, it needs to be provided to them to be able to make an informed decision on whether granting your medicines access to the market or not. And then on the other case, when you look about the role, you need to have the, the pharmaco QPPV, the qualified person for pharmacovigilance, is to establish and maintain a pharmacovigilance system master file. I mentioned this initially. Have an oversight over the functioning of the pharmacovigilance system, including the quality management system, because it's about the safety of the products and the quality of the product to ensure that we uphold public health interests. And therefore, you need to be having an oversight and to be able to report when there are any deviances that need to be addressed. Then there is a single, you will ask as a single point of contact to the pharmacy and poison board on all matters relating to quality and safety. When there is unreported incidents about safety of your medicine or an adverse event that has been reported, we know our reporting system. An individual can report as a patient. The healthcare system, we have healthcare professionals who can need also to report. If they're not able to you as an individual, in case you collect them, you should also report. So if it doesn't get to you as the QPPV first, it goes to the regulatory authority, then the regulatory authority pharmacy and poison board should be able to last with you and see how to mitigate this and address such kind of shortfall. And if it gets to you, you should also be the point of contact in relaying the same to the board. Then the other thing is to prepare, review, and implement standard operating procedures on pharmacovigilance-related activities, which is important because 
there's a guide on how things need to be done, how, where they need to be done, and how to do them over time so that we have a systemized process that it doesn't depend on me thinking of how I need to do it and I stop it at that, and another person also does it a different way. Then the other thing is to be aware of the validation statuses of adverse drug reaction databases, including failures in these products that occur and the corrective actions to address these. For example, we have a drug, a drug drug reaction database that notifies that these are drug reactions that have been annotated with their product A. If these are going to happen, we need to validate and see these are an adverse reaction, they still need to use it, doesn't pose much of a risk to the patients, then that is a database that is in place. In case there is a problem and of notice that there are some gaps, then what is the corrective action? We need to update the database and also give guidance information on indication and use of the medicine to the clinicians, the physicians, and to the regulator to make a decision on whether it should still be left in the market to circulate. The other thing is to establish and maintain a system where they can collect all suspected adverse reactions, process them, evaluate, and submit to the board. As we're talking about pharmacovigilance, being able to detect, analyze, assess, finally make an understanding and we will establish the cost and reporting accordingly so that we prevent continuous occurrences of such kind of activities. The other bit is to train other associates. When you're working in a company, obviously we have a marketing team, the qualified PPV as a member of the team. We have quality assurance teams and all the people that you're working with in that ecosystem, including medical sales representatives. We have regulatory affairs persons, all the stakeholders you work with in the pharmaceutical system. They need to be trained on their responsibility around pharmacovigilance reporting. And even the patients, the external stakeholders, let's say your medicines are going to a particular hospital, are they informed on how they need to report? Do they give information on how to relay that information to you and also to the regulator? And these are some of the advances that are happening that we need to be cognizant of as the role of the QPPV. So we're looking at it as a person with the responsibility of safety and pharmacovigilance, then how do you become one? The Pharmacy and Poison Board stipulates that a person that needs to, a, a QPPV role is, actually reserved for pharmacists, that is one. You have to be a pharmacist. And if this is based on the fact that in our pharmaceutical training and education undergraduate program, you understand the aspect of safety, pharmacovigilance and monitoring, reporting, and actually actioning in terms of ensuring you protect the public from such kind of harm. So if you're able to understand this is what pharmaco is, the, the impact of the medicines, you understand the side effects, the adverse events, then how can you report them? Do you understand the implication of use of your medicines? the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic factors. How do they impact the quality of life of a patient? Can you transfer that skill? So being that is the critical case, as a pharmacist, you have the background and the knowledge to do that. So QPVV, who should be a pharmacist? So the first way it is have a pharmacy degree. That is number one. Beyond pharmacy degree, oftentimes, we might not have to get further certification, further qualification, but having the pharmacy degree as a standing point, you can already be a QPPV in any of the organizations that are working in the pharmaceutical industry because you have the requisite baseline training and knowledge on pharmacovigilance and safety. Then the next thing is you to get certification recognition in certain, from recognized institutions. I know the University of Nairobi in Kenya has a master's of science in pharmacovigilance and pharmacovigilance, which is a good one. You can take such as, such as a course and a master's program. And there are other programs that are being rolled in terms of short courses, certification programs, postgraduate diplomas that are talking about pharmacovigilance. However, before you take up a course, it's better that you consult with the Pharmacy and Poisons Board to actually establish that. The institution in which you want to pursue that program is recognized by the Pharmacy and Poisons Board. There's no benefit in you pursuing a course in an institution that is not accredited and will therefore not be able to confer you the credit points that you need to be recognized as a specialist. And the specialist categorization within the Pharmacy and Board, Poisons Board is still advancing. So that is a critical criteria that you need to meet pharmacies, this further certification. And it's also in the guidelines stipulated that as a company, once you've been employed as a pharmacist, within the first five years, they should be able to actually have trained you, help you to acquire a master's, and they also ensure you have refresher trainings on QPPV and pharmacovigilance systems within the organization and within the ecosystem to understand what's happening in the market and what needs to apply in your company to be able to achieve and deliver on your mandate. And you also have to be given the leverage and the ability to make decisions that are impacting the safety and quality. Because at certain times we know human nature, we can be compromised in certain ways, and that compromise might affect the ultimate outcome for the patient. 
and therefore as a QPPV, you are the person who has is bestowed with authority to make a decision on how you're going to protect the public, the end consumers of your medicines. So you have to be given the leverage and that has to be documented and presented to the regulator. So on that account, then you know, look at all the dynamics. It means all of us as pharmacists, currently we are all qualified to be QPPVs. And I think the major bit that you need to ask yourself, why are you not a QPPV or why have you not even ventured or even applied for such roles? Probably lack of knowledge. Now you know, I've shared this information with you. Two, learn how to package yourself and package the information about your training as a person, as a pharmacist. When you look at the QPPV, what are the roles that are being asked for? What responsibilities are in the job description? Are you able to pitch yourself in terms of that? What kind of experience do you have in promoting quality and patient safety? Are you able to report? Do you know the understanding of the local reporting system? Then for you to understand that, go to the Pharmacy and Poison's website, Poison's board website, read about the information on the guidelines on establishing you know, of QPPV, the safety and vigilance guidelines, that is the compendium for the East Africa and also the guidelines for the local country, so that you understand what are the reporting metrics. You can also read much on it on the clinical trials guidelines in Kenya. So this information is in these different resources. If you read them and able to position yourself and understanding, this is the requirement for clinical trials data, suspected adverse reactions, serious, fatal, or all that. You consolidate it and understand what is the implication of this information not being recorded at a good time, not being made available to the regulator in good time. Once you're able to do that, you position yourself as an expert in that area. You're able to go for those jobs, build a, build a case that makes you a credible stakeholder and a player in supporting the organization you're going to work for, whether it's one of the pharmaceutical companies, the biopharmaceutical companies, or even an NGO that is working in the healthcare space or a hospital. You can offer your value as a pharmacovigilance specialist because you're going to uphold patient safety. And there's no healthcare without patient safety. So that is a place that you need to play in. And when you do it, that would be your next gate pass to getting a fulfilling career in a promoting patient safety and quality of medical products to the patients that you're serving. Thank you so much. I hope this helps you make a decision. And if you want to pursue this course, keep engaging. Let's see how we can learn how we can grow together.